like to say thank you for the opportunity to join this uh, conversation. And uh, in the consumer side, working with enterprise architecture is not a very simple job. Uh, you need to convince, you need to talk with a lot of people, you need to talk with your executive, and to put enterprise architecture in a discussion with your executive board. It is not so simple to do. Uh, and if you look at the moment that you're living in the market, you see that you need to work with this digital transformation. Okay? Uh, so if you get your CEO, normally goes in a conference, and uh, when he come back, he say we need to do something because the market has changed a lot, and you need to do something faster. How uh, how can I do that? And uh, it's not a simple way because normally the company are doing a lot of uh, changes. Uh, probably here, all of your company are working some kind of agile process working in some kind of uh, uh, technology, new technology, structural uh, technology that you are implementing in your company. And sometimes it's very difficult for you to manage all of these things. Uh, as a head of enterprise architecture at Secred, just for you to understand, Secred is a medium side bank, uh, bank in Brazil. Uh, I, I, you need to work a lot to, to get all these expectations that you have in the executive point of view uh, with that you have in your IT structure. And join both sides is not so simple, but uh, working with enterprise architecture is possible to do that. Uh, in talking a little more specifically about digital transformation, uh, you have your opportunity to it's not possible to do that with the same team that you have already working in your company. Uh, we had the opportunity to do a lot of uh, benchmark and research about this before starting with your digital transformation. And uh, you didn't have another options instead to create a new group and working to change the culture of the company. Because it's very simple for you to change the culture of your company if you are working in a startup a very small group, or if you are working with a CMB uh, corporate, but I think you don't have here a uh, startup or CMB representant. I think all of us are from corporate uh, large enterprise companies. For this reason, uh, your initiative in digital transformation was to build another team to, de uh, to develop it and uh, address what uh, you and of, of your executives uh, linking what you have in your business approach it with your IT approach. Yeah. So, uh, I if I understood the question correctly, right? So, which basically is, is the CIA trap real and is it still going on, right? Um, so, I work with a lot of um, organizations that do not necessarily make the news in the sense that majority of organizations where you have a CIO, um, you know, and they don't, you don't hear about them if they do a great job of uh, transforming or, you know, a pretty bad job of transforming. And so my observations have been this. Um, you cannot escape the need for very strong leadership at the CIO, CTO level. And what I mean by leadership is a combination of a few things. One, you definitely need to have a very clear vision of what digital transformation is for your organization, meaning IT, and for your partners, if you will, the business side of the uh, you know, organization. And the third part, which I actually have uh, an issue is, uh, or rather challenge that I see with CIO, traditional CIOs is, they have come from a background, especially those who grew in organizations, their idea of uh, an organization has not changed how, how it has been for the first few years. They love to add the tag of digital, so they essentially go for what they call low-hanging fruit and said so they may pick some mobility, they may pick some, pick some areas that uh, they can easily come and uh, brand it within the organization that they have uh, driven some kind of transformation or they're doing some digital transition. And as a result of which, uh, the combination of all of these things, what you typically find is the CIOs, when they're asked to get to the next level of value delivery, a higher level of value delivery that goes beyond low-hanging fruit that basically translates into true transformation of processes, true transformation of the company's digital value delivery, they find themselves very short. 
So it typically what happens is this recycle of people. Now, unfortunately, uh, uh, what I have seen is you could lose the old CIO, but the new person who comes and still comes from the same stock, if you will, for lack of a better word, right? And they still replace the same, uh, kind of recreate the same problems. Maybe it pick a different area to do this. So what I, I would net net I come and say is that the CIO trap is real, and the biggest problem is that CIOs don't recognize that they are in a trap, and they typically tend to think that they are kind of you know changing the organization through putting things like you know business IT teams that uh, approve projects and so on and so forth. But I think the fundamentally not recognizing what digital is, not recognizing how they have to reinvent themselves from a thought process perspective drive an organizational change with you know, key champions, uh, people who will then sustain the chain, and people who are toxic to the chain needs to be moved out. Recognizing that all of these things that go behind an organizational change, um, not you know that has to happen. If they don't do it, then you're essentially going to have the same problem go again and again. There are organizations that's phenomenal. I've seen uh, PayPal do a great job. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, publications that came out of the CTO stock, the recent CTO stock, you'd see um, you know, how he has changed organizational culture, how he has ensured that uh, the millennials, if you will, or class ops are able to feed back into uh, you know, what, what works for them, how they can leverage their thought processes, and then at the same time having a, a mastermind alliance from a Napoleon Hill code, how he can get more feedback from different people. All of this has gone into him clearly defining what a digital vision is, how do I drive change in organization? How do I truly identify the areas of change and then propagate it to other areas too? So all of these things have come together for one person, right? And but there is a for every one good leader, you have a significant number of leaders who have misunderstood what this digital is and hence continue to the same thing that Genie speaks about. Right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, from the supplier side, from the education side, I. Uh, I would think it's just coming from the leaders and also needs to be from the bottom up as well. The, if there is any transformation to take place, there has to be efforts or the desire to change from both top and bottom. So in order to make or facilitate that, I think having the right kind of education and giving the right kind of background to all concerned in any organization uh, is important. Yeah, I, I look at the CIO trap in terms of, let, let's compare IT to HR and finance. Um, and I think that, that that will help us understand, you know, statements like, well, the CIO is going to go away. Um, I don't think the CFO is going to go away, but there's a very different relationship in my experience around the topic of money in large organizations. If I'm a line manager and I'm in a conversation with the CFO, in general, as a line manager, I'm going to be financially literate, and I'm going to be able to have a very point-for-point -point conversation with the chief financial officer. The trouble in IT is, is that when that same line manager goes to the chief information officer, there has been a power imbalance because the chief information officer deals with complexity and concerns that the line manager become is feels very unfamiliar with. And I think part of digital transformation is overcoming this power imbalance, in part through the creation of digital natives and people who simply uh, you know, understand that actually creating a new digital system, well, yeah, there's some complexity there, but there are certain aspects that don't have to be spoken about in a technical way and yet need some professional understanding. But at the end of the day, the, chief, the CIO cannot manage all of the information and computing any more than the CFO manages every last financial aspect in a large organization. It's more of a governance role. It's more of setting standards and guidance and guardrails and making sure that bad things don't happen. But at the end of the day, the organizational units need to have independence of their uh, information strategies just as much as they need it for you know, what they choose to, you know, how they're going to manage their P&L and what their staffing strategy is going to be and so forth to bring in the HR side.
to give you more liberty and uh, you need to change how you manage your team you cannot do the same that you did before if you want to implement some uh, digital transformation you need to empowerment of this team must be in place not just in a speech because you have uh, normally in a large company you have a lot of speech about this but sometimes you don't have this already, already implemented in your day so you need to do that but um, you need to change the culture of these levels too because it is a very good point about the CFO you need to work with your CFO, CIO to try to sell a digital transformation project and to help them to give this information to the company and to empower, to empower your, your analyst, your operational force to follow you. Without a leadership in this situation, it will not be possible to change in a digital transformation. So, so if, if I think one of the part of the question was, is being, I mean, is the edge, that's the definition different from an Amazon to a shell? Yes, right? Um, the concept of an edge might be the same. What goes within that unit of the edge would obviously be different company to company. And um, the idea of empowerment obviously also changes according to that. But it's definitely markedly different from how we did business before, right? Uh, a key part of emp no, empowerment is one, clearly understand what's the framework they operate in. Not a restrictive framework like ARBs and so on and so forth. Um, essentially come and say, you are responsible for working or you are responsible for delivering a product that supports this particular market segment. Could be, for example, could be Amazon's Prime that focuses predominantly on, let's say, okay, the Amazon delivers. That's a group that delivers and drives the, the um, uh, coordination between groceries and delivering it to your home. Right? So obviously, there is it, it's very dynamic. Right? It, it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. So the team that delivers a product has to work very closely with the guys who manage the supply chain, look at the whole picture, and the guys who are coordinating constantly with the local grocers and so on and so forth, so that they can you know, dynamically deliver certain, you know, could be promotions, could be change in market conditions, could be routing, maybe they're using uh, an, a, a freelancer to deliver products versus their own supply chain, you know, truck person. All of these things ha are pretty dynamic. So the edge team should be able to deliver or change their platform appropriately. At the end of the day, they still have to meet the requirement of, I am supposed to ensure that the customer gets the product, the groceries in the appropriate time. They're supposed to get it in a you know, in the manner where they are not really pissed off and call Amazon again and again. So there are certain framework components that they can have to deliver. But at the end of the day, um, they should have the ability to go ahead and use the information they have change the platform appropriately and meet the customer expectations. So that's the nature of freedom I see in the edge uh, organizations. Yeah, I really don't know exactly details, so I think I'll pass. Um, em empowering the, the edge, I mean, there's a couple different aspects to it, but I, th I think it really speaks to the need or the, the recognition that the people who are most familiar with the problem are the people who are dealing with it every day. And this is an insight that was pioneered at Toyota, for example. Uh, it's essential to lean philosophy and lean thinking. Um, more recently, there's been some interesting influx of observations from military doctrine and military theory. Uh, there's a, one of my favorite authors is uh, Don Reinertsen, who actually is ex-Marine Corps and now is focusing on product development. He's one of the leading theorists of product development. And he said that he, he points out in one of his books that the Hollywood you know, caricature of the military is completely command and control is actually not true, at least in the Marine Corps, um, where there's an emphasis on initiative and team, uh, emphasis on initiative and team autonomy uh, while maintaining, al maintaining alignment to overall commander's intent, mission intent, and actually orders are considered incomplete without a statement of what the overall objective is, rather than dwelling on you know the specific tasks that might be planned out, because as we all know, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So I think that this is, uh, you know, that there is a, a lot of discussion in Agile and DevOps and Lean Circles um, on this topic in particular. And given the fluidity of the current economic and technological environment, I think it's
it's one of the overriding factors that leads me to think that you know no AI is not going to automate away a lot of these jobs right now just because this stuff does the, the reality is moving far too quickly and it's going to lead to increasing attention to human machine partnership rather than just assuming that we can automate stuff away because it's simple and routinely understood. That's actually a very good way to connect the dots between this discussion and yesterday's discussion. When somebody was talking about the humans in the loop, you know, that's that's actually is in power on the edge. And one of the things that Steve Katara was the one who put me, uh, uh, you know, made me aware of this was that um, a big challenge in the oil and gas industry is how you actually empower some of the control operators to do things like you know move IP around different systems and actually you know take your um, you know how you make you know bread or oil or whatever you do and move it out there so you know while yeah you know not every not every organization is digital right you don't deliver digital products and services as primarily business as usual that's probably not true for Shell your primary real estate is you know some sort of a valve and a pipe right um, but still the need to actually give the tools to the teams at the edge has a lot of similarities between what we're seeing in the purely digital world and even in something as far away from that as the operational world. So it's uh, something to propagate out. Yes, I can hear you, Doctor. Uh, so that's one thing that I think is interesting. Uh, I think it's very funny when you look into Amazon and other companies, Apple, and you just uh, try to get the inspiration that you what you're going to change in our company. But uh, in my opinion, this is different if you try to cop. It's not just a cop and pass process that you can do in your company. Uh, I had an example that uh, I was discussing in Brazil uh, one time ago. If you have some problem with your Spotify, and for some reason it's not possible for you listen, uh, uh, to earn uh, music, no problem for you. But I work in a bank. Ah, I just... Uh, uh, I lost a uh, uh, transaction, okay? I promise to check for you, but uh, it's happening, it's normal, okay? There's no problem. Uh, so the environment must be related with your business. I'm not saying that it's not possible to implement this in a banking. No, no, you must implement this in a banking. But you need to see your business strategy, your business, uh, and not just to get experience from another company for other industry and try to do the same things in your uh, company. It is only the experience that you, you had uh, in your bank. We've got a couple of questions that are more on opening the process, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'm going to field those. People are asking about how will this influence other industry standards like COGAP, and do we see it influencing standards outside the, uh, outside the industry? Um, the, D, the DPWG is exclusively set up as a working group for your members, so we can, in fact, get people in from these other groups and connect the dots. There's very explicit sections, for example, in the DP 
definitely have a section that talks about cultural impact. And so I think there's nothing that precludes us from specifically looking at a, a major social trend like the impact of social, uh, I mean, into smartphones, right? So in, in about uh, three, four, five years, my, five years, my son will probably come to college and then five years from there, he's probably going to be in the workforce. And so he's going to be a lot more, and he's, he's going to be a part of the most productive you know, uh, workforce that's going to be there at that point in time. Usually the first 10 years of your life is where you do a lot of the trench work and you're uh, kind of delivering value. So from that perspective, I think there's nothing that precludes the DP box from um, looking at a particular cultural trend and understanding what's the impact of it. Um, so that's the first part of the answer. So there's nothing, you know, we, I think we definitely can if that's an area of interest. Uh, the second thing I think you asked is uh, the power and simplicity uh, of the smartphone. At the end of the day, if you go back to Steve Jobs, right, the guy who kind of popularized the idea of an iPod, a small device, it, it, it again, it translates to something very simple. It's experiences. The reason why you are able to love the iPod and kind of develop that kind of passionate liking for it, sometimes irrational liking for certain devices, is because of the kind of experiences it provides you. So if you are an owner of a business application enterprise system, then if you replicate better experiences for your users, you can still develop that kind of passionate liking to use the system, right? Um, so that's, so the simple answer is yes. Um, there's gonna be difficulties or complexities associated with implementing those things because the number of people are larger. It's just not personal, it's com or corp or organizational, corporate you know, regulations and so on and so forth. But the fundamental premise is, if you can replicate experiences for every person participating in a process, but kind of expect to deliver kind of value, I think uh, its durability and its use is going to be that much more better. Uh, actually, as I looked at both the you know, 
resources that I end up hiring, I actually find that the biggest skill gap actually I find is not obviously modeling and programming skills. Those things can definitely be taught. It's with the enterprise architects who are experienced. They have the higher, you know, their ability to adapt to this world. Uh, the changing digital world is actually uh, far less than the ability for the millennials to actually absorb. Uh, and uh, again, it, it might be a little bit of a hard statement, but I've been hiring over the last 12 months uh, in this new mixed format, if you will. And the failures, if you say, as a resource in terms of delivering the value after appropriate coaching has been on the EA side and the experienced uh, enterprise architect side. The millennials have their own challenges in that, that you know, everything is super free, the idea of structure is a little bit difficult, but the value they bring in in terms of understanding the culture, understanding what it means to relate to the market today is phenomenal. And obviously, the moment you establish your credibility as a valid mentor, they learn things very fast. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, so if I was, so if you ask for a skill gap, I think if you're an experienced EA and you feel that you can do more and some there's a kind of a challenge in terms of meeting, I can do more versus I'm not being asked to do more, it's a good idea to go back and look, am I adaptable? Am I understanding what's going on in the market and am I reflecting that market change and then marrying my experience to that and delivering a higher quality of value that, than I did before? Millennials, to me, they can train fast. They bring in a very valid social impact and what kind of a perspective that um, is phenomenal. So. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very relevant question. Actually, we need to keep our uh, education relevant to be useful in the profession. And in order to do that, we certainly, uh, we constantly um, survey our graduating students, uh, students who have worked for several years. We also consult with our advisory board. We are constantly trying to see what is it that we may be missing or what is it not there. And we accordingly, and we do get a lot of feedbacks. And in spite of our best effort to make the best professional education possible, we do get lots of things and we do correct ourselves. In, and instead of going into specific, I think uh, I'm just trying to say we are conscientious about it and we always try to correct our, we, need to, we do incorporate change based on the feedbacks. Charlie, I see our lights are flashing here. A quick, uh, sure. Um, this is not an easy question or easy an easy problem. So just in, in brief, I mean, there's, there's a long discussion in education about vocational versus core principles. And it's a discussion that will never go away because this year it's going to be React and next year it's going to be Angular. Last year it was, you know, Vagrant. This year it's Kubernetes. And all of this stuff just continually keeps turning over. But there are certain principles where education, I think, did fall behind a bit and certain principles that I have no trouble saying we need to, to base ourselves on things like infrastructure as code, continuous delivery, the importance of the team experience and product development. These, I think, are longer cycle dynamics or longer cycle principles that we can indeed, you know, stake our education on. But it's not easy identifying them given how quickly, you know, the, the, the ephemera of technology seems to be coming and going all the time. Uh, so it just takes ongoing attention and work and thought and discussion um, such as we're trying, we're having in the DP Bach.